Hello, my name is Miss Kayla, the children's librarian at the Dubuque County Library, and welcome to Story Starters. Every week I read the first couple chapters of a different children's chapter book, mostly geared towards second through fifth grade. So the book I've got with me today is called Maya and the Robot by Eve L. Ewing. So I'm going to read the first few chapters and you can settle in at home and listen along. Chapter one, the worst science fair ever. If you looked outside through the cafeteria windows, it seemed like a perfectly normal day. The sun was shining, birds were chirping, a regular day, a beautiful day even. But inside the cafeteria, things were anything but normal. All around me, kids and adults were screaming. I tried to shut out the chaos for a second and focus on the sunlight. Just breathe, I told myself. Count your breaths, calm down. One, two, yeah! came the ear-piercing yell from behind me. My computer is covered in pudding. Pudding! I spun around to see Zoe Winters, the most popular girl in my class, standing in front of the display table where her science fair project had once stood. When I had walked into the cafeteria carrying my own project, I noticed how neat the whole thing was. The letters that spelled the project title, coding coping and circuits across the top of the board. The computers and circuits and batteries set up in a display at the front of the table. Now it was a mess that mostly resembled a pudding waterfall. Pudding dripped over the title, smeared across the letters, so it said, Cod Circus. Pudding filled the keys of the keyboard, computer keyboard. But I really cringed when I saw something even worse than ruining an expensive computer. So we hadn't noticed yet, but there was also pudding in my hair, chocolate pudding in my hair. Okay, I guess she had noticed. Brown, thick, fudgy droplets cascaded from Zoe's once perfect curls into her eyes. And she stopped saying words and started making horrible gurgly sounds. <laughs> I was going to go over and help her when a streak of something yellow flew past my ear. I looked behind me to see that it was creamed corn. It had been launched with the accuracy of a fastball, landing dead center in a huddle of screeching first graders. They were sheltering in the corner with their teacher screeching and giggling at the pudding waterfall, but now that it was raining corn, they started panicking and running in circles, except for one kid who must have been hungry because he started trying to catch the bits of flying corn with his mouth. Mommy, I got my corn, wailed a kindergartner. She took off running at top speed to try to get as far away from the corn hurricane as possible. No, stop! I yelled after her, but it was too late. She skidded on a gross mixture of pudding and corn that was waiting on the floor like a cartoon banana peel, her light-up gym shoes slipping and sliding as she struggled to stay upright. Desperate, she grabbed the nearest solid piece of furniture, in the corner of the display table where my best friend Jada was trying to guard the scale model she had built of a suspension bridge. It was a work of art. I could tell Jada must have fussed over it for weeks. It wasn't any old thing she made it out of the kit. There were Legos and toothpicks, tiny wires, plastic beads, popsicle sticks, and even a tiny glowing LED light at the top of the bridge. And it was complex and beautiful. The little kid grabbed the table and Jada froze, seeing her creation in danger but not knowing what to do. She couldn't push the younger kid out of the way, but I could see by the pain on her face that she was strongly considering it. No! A voice screamed, and when they both turned their eyes on me, 
I realized the voice was mine. Have you ever seen one of those videos that shows an avalanche coming down a mountain in slow motion? Imagine that, but replace the snow with Legos and toothpicks and beads. And you'll see what I saw as Jada's project came tumbling down onto the small girl sitting pitifully on the floor in a puddle of pudding. Jada stood there, arms hanging at her sides, and watched it happen. For a second, she seemed to be in shock. Then she took a deep breath, furrowed her brow, and hollered at the top of her lungs. This is the worst science fair ever! And then she began to cry. First her voice, then her sobs reverber reverberated around the room, but no one seemed to hear her. Everyone was too busy trying to handle the disaster that was unfolding. The gym teacher was blowing his whistle for order but it stopped making any sound when a blob of mashed potatoes flew into his face. He kept blowing, but the whistle only shot out white, white specks of mashed potatoes with every breath. Miss Hickson, the cafeteria lady, had transformed into some kind of acrobatic martial artist, leaping from table to table, slapping flying food projectiles out of the air with a huge metal spoon. You think this is my first food fight? This ain't my first food fight, she yelled at no one. In one corner, there was so much cream corn spilled on the floor that it made a pond large enough for several preschool kids to be sitting in it and having the time of their lives, putting it in each other's hair and throwing it at each other and grinning like it was a playground sandbox. Near the door, Mr. Samuels, the custodian, was standing forlornly with a bucket, shaking his head. Nope he said over and over. Nope, 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 no way. I'm gonna need a bigger mop. Pudding and mashed potatoes and corn were on everything. On the tables, the floors, the walls, in people's hair. Pudding was splattered on the windows. People were digging mashed potatoes out of their ears and wiping it off their glasses. And smack dab in the middle of the mayhem, there he was, whirling in circles at top speed, scooping food out of the industrial-sized vats and launching it in every direction, beeping at a terrible high pitch, flashing multicolored lights, and appearing perfectly willing to spend the whole rest of the day tossing potatoes at people with no sign of stopping. This calamity, the screaming, the mess, the ruined science fair, this was his fault. No, I realized. This was my fault. After all, he was my robot. My spinning, beeping, flashing, food catapulting, going completely berserk in the school cafeteria robot. Right on cue, I felt a tap on my shoulder and turned around to see Principal Merriweather. She was scowling. I gulped. You, my dear, are in big, big trouble, she said. I opened my mouth to respond, but before I could speak, a glob of pudding hit me right in the middle of my forehead. I guess I kind of deserve that. And I found out that getting hit in the head with projectile pudding is more painful than it looks. How did I get here? I didn't wake up, hop out of bed and say, I want to be a troublemaker kid who brings a robot to school and stands by doing nothing while it goes bonkers in the cafeteria, starts a creamed corn apocalypse, ruins the science fair, and makes my best friend cry. And definitely not my goal. I swear, I'm really a regular person. And at the moment, a regular person who is probably going to get suspended. Unless for some reason the principal enjoys wearing a pile of mashed potatoes in the hat. Well, I'm mostly a regular person. A regular person with a robot. But it wasn't always that way. If the year had gone how I'd wanted it to, I probably wouldn't have a robot at all. It all started on the first day of school. Chapter 2. The First Day. Pancakes warm, golden, perfect pancakes. 
thousands of them piled high, a mountain of pancakes. I put on my climbing gear, threw my rope and grappling hook up Pancake Mountain, and started to make my way towards the summit. As I went along, I reached out and grabbed pieces of the mountain and popped them into my mouth. Glistening streams of maple syrup flew down the side, and I stuck my tongue out to catch the droplets of sweetness. Then, in a booming voice, someone was calling to me from the peak. What's that what they were saying? They seemed upset. Who could be upset on Pancake Mountain? Pancake Mountain is a place of joy and happiness. Who? Maya, I am not going to tell you again. Turn that alarm off and let's get a move on. I sat straight up in bed and rubbed my eyes. I looked around. Not a pancake to be found. Not even the mini sized silver dollar ones. And my mother, from the sound of things, was not happy. It would be so nice to just drift back to sleep where everything was cozy and warm and syrupy. If only I could turn off that alarm. My eyes darted to the corner of the bedroom I share with my little brother, Amir. On the desk was a bunch of dried Play-Doh he had left out, a couple of stuffed animals, a model of the solar system with little tiny teeth marks in Saturn and Mercury. I mentioned the little brother, right? A pile of my overdue library books. I'm almost done with that May Jemison biography, and then I'll send it back, I swear. And the beeping alarm clock. Next to it was my book bag, full of school supplies, and the clothes I had laid out the night before. Oh my gosh, today is the first day of school. The bedroom door flew open, and my mom, my mother, leaped into the room. She tugged the covers off of me. Let's go, Patricia Maya Robinson. My mother has two jobs, but somehow manages to have the most enthusiasm and energy of anyone in the world. I knew she had been up before the sun, getting a mirror ready for my grandma to pick him up and take him to daycare, getting my lunch together, and listening to the radio. Unlike pretty much every other adult I'd ever met, she didn't even drink coffee but she always seemed ready to do backflips in the morning. Maybe that would be a good science fair project, I thought. Adult responses to caffeine. Does it have to do with age, height, weight, blood type? What about Maya? Don't make me tell you again. I got it, Mom. I'm up. I groaned and climbed out of bed. I'll get dressed. Oh, I know you will, she replied. I went over to the desk threw the dried Play-Doh in the trash with lightning speed and picked up the neatly folded school clothes. She tossed them onto the foot of the bed. You've got five minutes, baby girl. I need you washed, dressed, and ready to eat. Fast, so you can get out the door on time. I picked up Miss Yolinda's shift, and I can't take you to school if you miss the bus. Okay, I mumbled, still half asleep. Drowsily, I tugged off the satin bonnet that I had worn to protect my freshly braided first day of school hair. I was surprised it stayed on throughout the sleeping and dreaming. I probably have a big line on my forehead. Better hurry up, Mom called over her shoulder as she hustled out of the room and back to the kitchen. I made pancakes. Pancakes? Suddenly, I wasn't so sleepy. Why didn't you say so? I got dressed in record time. If only the first day of school had ended as well as it started. The pancakes were delicious, and then it was pretty much downhill from there. When I got to the playground right away, I headed to where MJ and Jada would be waiting for me. I know everyone thinks that their best friends are their best, best friends. But my friends are the certified, record-breaking, greatest friends in the solar system. Probably the galaxy. I was really excited to get back to school and see them. Most of the kids at my school live in different neighborhoods and different parts of the city, so I don't get to see them as much as I want to. Sometimes I read books and see TV shows where the characters are riding bikes to each other's houses every day after school, and that always makes me sort of jealous. If I could ride my bike to see Jada or MJ, 
I would be with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Instead, I have to wait for someone to plan it out and give me a ride. That's no fun. When we were able to get together, I think of really, when we are able to get together, I think we think of really creative things to do. Jada and MJ are always down to assist with my latest science project. And they get just as excited as I do when I can actually get something to work. One time, we spent 12 hours building a Rube Goldberg machine that could tip a watering can and water a plant when you put a race car on the track. Another time, we made up our own movie with a script and everything. And then MJ's brother let us use his phone to record it and edit it. It was a mystery called The Case of the Missing Toaster. And I got to be the detective searching for the toaster. MJ was the villain who stole it. And Jada was the director. We tried to make MJ's cousin Boogie play a, the role of the toaster, but he wouldn't do it. Another time, we went down to Jada's basement built a giant fort out of blankets and spent the rest of the day with some flashlights, making up stories and looking through the photos and yearbooks Jada's grandpa left down there, laughing at the funny old hairstyles and fashions. Jada's mom has a catering business, and sometimes she lets us help her prepare food for someone's birthday or wedding shower. One time, she showed us how to test if a cupcake is done. You stick a toothpick in the center, and if it comes out wet, it needs more time. And how to perfectly balance a cherry on top of a bunch of frosting. On Halloween, sometimes we trick or treat at MJ's because he lives in a really big apartment building with hundreds of people, not just three apartments like my building. Last year, we went door to door inside, which was good because it was pouring rain out and we still got a lot of candy. I knew that this year we could have just as much fun. When we hang out at my house, we usually play with a mirror, and since I have the biggest Lego collection of anybody, we work on those for hours and hours, either following directions or making our own Lego designs. We don't have to be super creative all the time. Sometimes we play video games or watch television and relax. Jeff our daddy calls us the three Jedi Knights. He's the one who showed us the original Star Wars movies. And then he showed us old cowboy westerns where George Lucas got his ideas from. Some people would laugh if they went to visit their friend and their friend's dad wanted to watch a bunch of old movies. But Jada and MJ were completely into it. They're really open to trying something new. And even if they weren't feeling it, they wouldn't have laughed. See what I mean? greatest friends in the Milky Way. I spotted them right away in our usual spot by the fence overlooking the basketball court. MJ and I are into watching on the sidelines. Jada, who is a basketball fiend, wishes she could jump in the game. But the older kids always take over and so Jada usually lingers at the edge of the fence with lost puppy dog eyes trying to get up the courage to ask them if she can join. Today was no different. I can't wait until we're in seventh grade, she said when I arrived. No hello or anything. And she didn't look me direct she didn't look at me directly. Her eyes were locked onto the ball as it bounced three times against the pavement and then soared through the air, arcing towards the basket. As soon as I get a chance, I'm gonna be the first in line for tryouts, MJ said. We've heard the speech so many times that he's able to finish the sentence for her at this point. Jada barely noticed, still hypnotized by the action on the court. Didn't Coach Tanaka say she might let you try out next year? I said to Jada, poking her gently in the arm to remind her that MJ and I exist. Since you're already as tall as most of the seventh grade girls anyway. Yeah, Jada said wistfully. She turned, consciously noticing me for the first time. Hi, Maya. Hi, Jada. Hi, MJ. Before MJ could respond, an older boy who overheard us walked away from the court and leaned over the fence, 
furrowing his brow. MJ rolled his eyes. He already knew what was coming. Hey, said the boy, I got a question. If your name is Michael Jordan, why are you so scrawny? MJ ignored him, but Jada wasn't here for it. First of all, she said, stepping up to the fence to face the boy, your joke isn't very original. He's heard it a million times. Ooh, let's see a dunk, Michael Jordan. Where's your championship ring, Michael Jordan? It's old. Second of all, our boy here grew a good two inches over the summer. Can't you tell? Sure. Okay. Some of that is his hair standing up, but by this point, Jada had managed to bore the older boy to death, and he lost interest in making fun of MJ, wandering back towards the action of the game. MJ was flushed red, ready to about die of embarrassment. Man, you gotta ignore them, Jada said. We're in fifth grade now. Forget their old jokes. And you really did grow some over the summer, I said. As MJ stood there with his arms crossed, fuming, I walked around them so that we were standing back to back. We were about the same height, but I hovered my hand over both of our heads so that it was hard so that it was hard to tell who was taller. See? You're taller than me. MJ was unconvinced. I wish I didn't have to ignore them he said, frowning. Why couldn't I have a regular name? Even Michael would help with Jordan would be an improvement. I don't know what my dad was thinking. He was thinking you were going to be great, said Jada. Epic, unstoppable, a high school basketball star, following in the footsteps of his pops. She folded her arms, pretending to cradle a baby, and batted her eyes down lovingly. She was looking at you, his brand new baby boy and thinking he is going to be exactly what it says on the statue. The best there ever was. The best there ever will be. Last year, MJ's dad had taken the three of us to our first basketball game. His brother, MJ's uncle, works for the city, fixing big potholes in the ground. His job gave him free tickets for a special occasion and we got to go. We sat so way high up that the players were the size of hamsters as they ran around on the court, but it was still one of the best days ever. And we took a picture together in front of the big Michael Jordan statue. The best there ever was, the best there ever will be. Ever since then, Jada had become obsessed with the phrase, writing it in the back of her notebook over and over. She turned and grinned at me. You finally made it. She said, I was worried you would be late for the first day of school. She gave me a big hug. Jada is the kindest person I know. A lot of kids act scared of her or think she's mean because she's so much taller than them. But she's been my friend and stuck by me since we were in kindergarten. And she helped me get the best blocks off the top shelf that I couldn't reach. But it's not because she's my bestie. She's nice to everybody. I stepped back and lifted a hand to greet MJ, since that older boy had interrupted us. Hey, Grumpy. MJ reached a hand out and we exchanged our special dab. Two, two quick slides of the hands, two quick taps of the peace signs against our chests and an exploding fist. Hey, Goofy, he said back. This was our ongoing joke. MJ is as kind-hearted as Jada, but he's not so quick to show it. He's always got this super serious frowny face, and his brain tends to jump to thinking about the worst thing that could possibly happen. He says that I'm too quick to lose track of things, to let my mind wander and start thinking about impossible stuff instead of facing reality. I say that he's too negative, always too concerned about the bad things that could maybe happen but he forgets the good stuff that is happening. We were both right, and that's part of what makes us a good match as friends. Not being the same, but being two sides of the same coin. I reached into my pocket, grabbed a small plastic bag of apple slices I had brought with me from home and started to munch on one. So, are y'all feeling ready for today? I'm just a 
Amy is a bit scared. I know I'm ready for fifth grade, but I have heard that Miss Rodriguez is really mean and strict. Jada and MJ both gave me a funny look that made me nervous. Was I being a baby? I mean, don't get me wrong, I said quickly. I think we can handle it together. And this is the science fair year. I just kind of got butterflies in my stomach is all. They looked at each other and back at me. Naya, said Jada gently, we both got letters last week saying that we're going to be in Miss Montgomery's class. She frowned her brow, worried about me. We assumed you got a letter too. Miss Montgomery? They were in Miss Montgomery's class? What do you mean? I understood what they were saying, but also didn't get it at all. MJ, Jada, and I had been in the same class since we were five years old. Being in school without them was, well, I couldn't even imagine it. I guess some new kids got transferred into school at the very end of the summer. I had to switch some things around to make the numbers work. MJ and I ended up with Miss Montgomery. Miss Montgomery has a reputation for being the coolest, most fun teacher in the entire school. She played the blues guitar in the band on the weekends and sometimes would bring it to school and sing songs. She had three dogs and her room was decorated with pictures of them and lots of other animals. And most important to me, she was a scientist, a real one. She had been a chemist before becoming a teacher and she was always showing off amazing science demos in her class. She was even friends with some of the people at the Museum of Science and Industry. And when she took her classes on field trips there, they got special behind the scenes tours. MJ and Jada were going to be in Miss Montgomery's class, listening to her play guitar and sing songs she made up about the water cycle and the different parts of the ecosystem and doing real lab experiments with microscopes and chemicals. Meanwhile, I would be stuck in Miss Rodriguez's class. Miss Rodriguez, whose main claim to fame was that she once made a kid write a 10 page report about gum after he stuck some under the desk. Great. And worst of all, we wouldn't be together. How would I make friends? Who would I sit with at lunchtime? Who would I do group projects with? Instead of asking any of these questions out loud, I stood there in silence, feeling like a rain cloud was hovering over my head. My worry must have shown on my face because MJ reached out and patted me on the shoulder. It'll be okay, Maya, he said. Even if you don't make any new friends, there's always next year. Next year? Jada gave him a look. Don't listen to him, Maya. You're going to have a great year. And we can still hang out in the morning. We might have recess at the same time, too. Plus, how bad can Miss Rodriguez really be? I was about to try to say something brave when we were interrupted by an ear-shattering whistle. We looked towards the school entrance. Miss Montgomery was standing by the door. She had long dreadlocks, elegantly twisted up on the top of her head, a huge pair of glasses with gold rims, and she was holding a bright pink clipboard. Students were crowding around her eagerly, and she was greeting each of them with a warm smile. But she was not the one who had blown the whistle. Fifth grade, bellowed a woman standing nearby. Fifth grade, it's time to line up immediately. She looked around the playground, scowling. She stood at attention, her back completely straight, and she held a regular plain looking clip, brown clipboard in her hand which she tapped impatiently. She reminded me of Miss Trunchbull from the book Matilda by Raoul Dahl. Across the playground, kids were scurrying over to her, terrified to get caught in her glare. This was Miss Rodriguez. Jada gulped so loud that I could hear her from a few inches away. And then she smiled a thin smile, putting on a positive face for my benefit. Well, she said, let's go line up. Maybe we'll see you later today, Maya. Yeah, I said weakly. Maybe. 
MJ started to say something, but obviously couldn't come up with anything. So he made a weird face, baring his teeth at me. Clearly it was supposed to be a smile, but MJ is not very good at faking his emotions. Uh, he said awkwardly, enjoy your, um, don't forget to write down your homework assignments at the end of the day. And he sprinted off, lining up with his class. I nodded and started walking towards the door. I knew that I was walking to my doom. But I am going to stop there. That was the first two chapters of Maya and the Robot by Eve L. Ewing. So if you'd like to find out what happens in the rest of the story and how Maya ends up with a robot, you can come by the Dubuque County Library and check out the book. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the story. Bye.